pray. Father, there's nothing greater that we could ask at this time in our worship together um, of you than through your word you would reveal more of your glorious son. Thank you for all that you accomplished in salvation for us. It is your work in salvation that is impressive. We believe. You work, we believe you. Open our eyes that we might see what saving faith is in your word. Open our eyes that we might see the God of justification. And it's in your great name that we do pray, the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and let's open them to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, we will finish it today. As you're turning there, I just want to say, Mike, thank you for coming. It's good to see you. We love you, brother. We grieve with you and we rejoice with you and Teresa's homegoing. We look forward to being with you on Friday at 10. Thank you. Romans chapter 4, verse 18 to 25. We're in a three-part series in this chapter called Old Testament Declarations Regarding Justification. And just a reminder of what justification is, it is God declaring righteous, his righteous status over an unrighteous sinner who believes. It's God declaring his righteous status over an unrighteous sinner who believes. Another word we learned in this chapter was, is the word imputation or being credited with righteousness. That's the same thing. It's, it's putting God's righteous status into the account of the unrighteous sinner who believes. Justification is through faith alone, quite apart from works. So the Old Testament is being appealed to here by the gospel, by Paul, to confirm that justification by faith alone is indeed the way that God has always saved sinners. In other words, the gospel is not a a new idea come lately. It's not a new way of being saved, and the Old Testament had its way of saving. The Old Testament and the gospel are in complete agreement. Now, with that said, I want you to think back to 2007 in your life. Ten years ago. I want you to think about ten years ago in your life, okay? Okay? What were you doing 10 years ago? For some of you, how many less kids did you have 10 years ago? Where did you, what did your job look like 10 years ago? Were you even married, some of you? Or for some of you who are younger, what grade were you in 10 years ago? Now you've got a little bit better idea of what a 10-year span of time is, Right? Well, hold on that and think on that in this sense for Paul. Over a 10-year period, which included three missionary journeys across the Roman Empire, countless synagogue visits, interacting with probably thousands upon thousands of Jews in those synagogues, Paul experienced just about every kind of response to the gospel that the Jews could come up with. Think about that decade of experiences and wisdom that he gleaned. During that time, he dealt with every possible Jewish response to the gospel, from the good response of faith and repentance toward Messiah, Jesus, to the complete opposite of of being chased out of the synagogue to the edge of the city and left for dead under a pile of rocks. And he experienced every response in between those two extremes. Romans 4 indicates that I think one of the central flashpoints he faced in responses to the gospel centered on the connection that the gospel makes between Abraham and Jesus in justification through faith alone. Romans 4 is how Paul dealt with Jewish objections to that linkage. Now, just to give you a a few verses to show you the connection that the New Testament makes between Jesus and Abraham, I want you to go back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, for just a moment. Look at this. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The very first verse of the New Testament 
What does it say? Matthew 1, 1. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. He's the son of David. He's the son of Abraham. The very first verse of the New Testament talks about a link between Jesus, Messiah, and Abraham. He's a son of Abraham. If you're going to read the New Testament, the New Testament wants to make sure you understand right away the genealogical connection between Abraham and Jesus. He is the descendant of all of the descendants of Abraham. Go to John chapter 8, verses 56 to 59. John 8, 56 to 59. Jesus has some very difficult words to say to the Jews around him who are disbelieving. He says this to him in John 8, 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. They knew exactly what he was saying, and therefore they picked up stones to throw at him because they believed he was blaspheming claiming to be Yahweh, who was predating even Abraham. So Jesus made a link between himself and the Jews. Look at Luke chapter 13. We saw this one last week. Luke 13, verse 27. Again, Jesus is having a very difficult conversation with the Jews who are rejecting him. He tells a story, a parable about those who will be not let in to the celebration of the kingdom when he comes again and he says in verse 27, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers, into that place. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out of it. You see, they thought they would, were sure guests of the kingdom. And Jesus is giving them some harsh words about it. Verse 29, and they will come from east and west and from north and south, and they will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus is driving a wedge between the hardened Jews who do not believe and the Abraham that he knows. Jesus himself claimed this link to Abraham. They are not equals, but Abraham was indeed on Messiah's side, on Jesus' side, not on the side of the unbelieving Jews. And as Paul preached this kind of a gospel connection between Jesus and Abraham, the Jews had a hard time seeing how what they had been taught about Abraham could put Abraham together with what they're hearing the gospel say about Jesus. What the Jews believed about Abraham, what they believed about justification, what they believed about faith was not what the gospel was teaching about Jesus, about justification, about faith, and even about Abraham. What the Jews believed, they believed because their rabbis taught them to believe it. And so when they hear the gospel's version of of Abraham and justification and faith and Jesus, it sounds to them like the gospel and the Old Testament and Abraham are at odds with one another. And so the protests come forth. And what the gospel does in Romans chapter 4 is masterful. The gospel goes directly to the Old Testament and through the Old Testament to show the, how inseparable justification through faith alone is between Jesus and Abraham. The Old Testament actually ends up affirming what the Jews are having difficulty receiving from the gospel. The Old Testament is actually contradicting everything that they've been taught by their rabbis. The Old Testament is actually dismantling the false teaching of the rabbis. Think about how way off the rabbis were, the teachers of Israel were in Jesus' day. John chapter 3, he comes up, Nicodemus comes up to him in the middle of the night, and, and, and Nicodemus was clueless about salvation, about being born again, about the need to be born again. And Jesus says to him, you're the teacher of Israel? It's that kind of quality of teaching that the Jews were under in the synagogues. 
And the gospel uses the Old Testament to go directly to Abraham to show his justification through faith alone and to show the grace that Abraham received from God in salvation. It wasn't through works. It wasn't through circumcision. It wasn't through law. The result was that the Abraham the gospel puts forward through the Old Testament is not the Abraham that the rabbis put forward to the Jews. And the effect from one synagogue to the next over 10 years and three missionary journeys was that the gospel of Jesus Christ was rescued Abraham. The gospel of Jesus Christ rescued the Old Testament and justification through faith alone and Messiah alone from the unbelieving Jews. The gospel came and the gospel took Abraham away from the unbelieving Jews who rejected the gospel. He cannot be theirs any longer. He belongs to the gospel of God's grace, and he belongs to believers in Messiah Jesus. And Romans 4 is the gospel argument that would try to help disbelieving Jews turn away from their wrong view of Abraham, from their wrong view of the Old Testament, and from their wrong view of justification. So this is our last Sunday in Romans 4. Let's read our section, verses 18 to 25. Follow along with me. In hope against hope, he, Abraham, believed so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. What is this chapter all about? This is what we've said. Four declarations from the Old Testament on justification prove that faith has always been God's unchanging way of saving unrighteous sinners. Justification through faith alone, apart from works, is not a new way to be saved that the gospel has come along and revealed. It is the same old, old way the Old Testament put forth, and Abraham is the central argument in that. The last two Sundays, we covered the first three Old Testament declarations. The Old Testament declares first, justification was never through works. Secondly, justification was never through circumcision. And thirdly, justification was never through law. You can listen to those last two weeks and familiarize yourself with that. And that leads us to the last declaration from the Old Testament this morning. Number four, the Old Testament declares justification was never for Abraham alone. Justification was never for Abraham alone. That's the big idea of where 4, 18 to 25 is going. The climactic end to the chapter, to the climactic end to the gospel argument is going that way, but it all starts with the stunning display of Abraham's faith in verses 18 to 22. So notice with me first, number one, the exemplary faith concerning justification. Justification, being credited with righteousness through faith alone, is still the focal point here. So showing how exemplary Abraham's faith is will actually show the kind of faith it is through which justification comes. Because that's where it's headed in verse 22. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Look at, look at, at verse 18 with me. In hope against hope, he believed. Abraham believed. But you have to tie that back to verse 17. He was in the presence of him whom he believed, God. He believed God. He believed the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. But notice the quality of this faith in verse 18. In hope against hope, he believed. 
<laughs> That's a turn of phrase that means Abraham believed against all odds. The only way to, in hope against hope, believe is if the hopes that are mentioned there are not the same hope. Abraham's believing was on the basis of one hope while being against the little and failing hope on the other. One hope is a hope from a, a limited or scant human resources. And the other hope is on the basis of God and who he is. And the God-given hope trounced the failing human resources hope. It looked like there was no human ground for hope in verse 18, becoming a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. That was the promise. Remember, it requires a world-sized stage for this nation's-sized promise. He is the heir of the world, Abraham is. Chapter 4, verse 13. And his descendants along with him. So there are two hopes. There's a, there's a human-centered failing hope, and then there's a God-centered hope, and, and those were in conflict concerning God's promise to Abraham. And in his faith, he believed on the basis of the one hope from God against the failing hope oriented in human ability. Verse 19 expands on this. It shows us this battle going on within Abraham as he believed. Everything seems to be stacked against him. Without becoming weak, verse 19, in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and he contemplated the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham contemplated two things. His own body, now as good as dead, and he contemplated Sarah's womb, the deadness of it. You see, that world-sized, nation-sized promise could only get started if a son's life could come out of that deadness. Abraham faced those two death facts. He didn't put his head into the sand, but he deliberately faced the death reality that was within him. He gave it careful attention. He contemplated it. Appearances were indeed considered. The truth from human assessment was he was in a very unpromising circumstance concerning the promise God made to him. Did that weaken his faith in God? No. Verse 19, without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated the deadness. It had no effect of weakening his faith. For Abraham to believe God, for Abraham to believe his promise, he didn't have to ignore the physical, human, world-rooted reality around him and even within him. He didn't have to ignore it and pretend like he didn't see the facts. He didn't need more self-assurance or self-esteem. In fact, do you understand this? That God deliberately chose a path for Abraham in which if he esteemed himself, the promise failed. There was nothing to esteem within him at this time of the promise concerning the fulfillment of God's promise to him. The faith associated with justification is not one that pretends to not see the odds against it. The faith associated with justification contemplates those things squarely and does so without becoming weak. Here's my question. Where does that faith come from? Where does it not come from? Verse 20 then continues the thought, expands on it. The main idea here is stated in the negative first. Look at it. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief. Unbelief there does not merely mean just the absence of believing. It doesn't mean that. Rather, it means the willful rebel refusal to believe. So Abraham did not waver back and forth into that willful refusal to disbelieve God. Did not waver means he wasn't divided within himself. 
He wasn't at strife within himself on that. The facts were in strife with one another, but he was not divided within. He had no internal strife within himself. He wasn't disbelieving God sometimes and then almost like in a schizophrenic way, believing God at other times. With respect to that world-sized, nation-sized promise that God made to him, he didn't waver in disbelief. He didn't flirt with disbelieving God. He didn't give disbelief a platform in his life to rail against the promise of God made to him. The last part of verse 20 states it positively, but in contrast, he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. To grow strong there is a, it's a passive verb, which means that Abraham didn't summon up from within himself by his own doing more strength and thereby strengthen himself. Passive verbs like this in the New Testament are often re, uh, called divine passives, meaning that God is the one who is acting upon the individual. So God was the one strengthening Abraham in the faith that he was exercising. It, it kind of sounds like God feels responsible for Abraham being up to the task of believing, for Abraham being up to the task of exercising that faith. What kind of faith could this be? that God would see Abraham exercising it and God would be pleased to strengthen Abraham so he could express that faith with even more vigor. Where does that kind of faith come from? Where does it not come from? And don't miss the last part of verse 20. It's amazing. Giving glory to God. Abraham, in the strength that God gave him for believing... He was a man giving glory to God. Abraham was oriented toward God in this faith that he was exercising. He only wanted to magnify God. He only wanted God to be seen to be the glorious and impressive, radiant, splendid God that he is. It's truly amazing. Because think about this. Think how God was taking this little man, this little old man, and magnifying him. A world-sized, nation-sized promise was coming from God to Abraham. He had the title, heir of the world, this little old man. If anybody was getting magnified, it looked like Abraham was being magnified by God. And yet, Abraham, with strength from God for believing, wasn't impressed with himself at all. This believing actually emptied himself of high thoughts of himself. It only filled him with high thoughts of God instead who made the promise. That God had to be magnified. That God had to be seen to be the weighty, impressive, radiant God that he was. Abraham, believing God, being strengthened by that God was glorifying that God. Now you tell me. Where did that faith come from? Where did Abraham find that faith? Where does it not come from? And think with me just for a moment on what Romans has told us about the glory of God so far. Go back to chapter 1, verse 22. This is shocking. Look at this. Romans 1, 22. Professing to be wise, they all of humanity, became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling reptiles. Verse 25, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. In our ungodliness, in our unrighteousness, we know the weightiness of God. We know the radiant splendor and the impressiveness of the God who made us, but we, in our rebellion, exchange it for an image that is actually a mockery of that great incorruptible God. Instead of 
worshiping this weighty, impressive one. Let's, let's scribble some pictures of man and birds and four-footed animals, and even let's go all the way down to the low dust and scribble some pictures of, uh, of a reptile crawling along the, the ground, and, and in worshiping that image, we mock the God of glory. Did that describe Abraham before God came to him in Ur of the Chaldeans? The answer is yes. We'll talk about this in a little bit, a little bit more. So how, how did that glory exchanging, ungodly, unrighteous Abraham end up believing God and doing just the opposite of what he had been doing which was rejecting the glory of God. Where did this exemplary faith in connection with justification, where did it come from? Where didn't it come from? Let's keep going. Leave you hanging a little longer. Further proof that Abraham was oriented strictly toward the God who promised and who was strengthening him is found in verse 21. And being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Here's the other fact that had to be put right next to the prior facts about Abraham and Sarah in verses 19 and 20. You remember that? It's the other set of facts. The first set of facts were contemplated. It was his own body, as good as dead, and it was Sarah's womb, which was full of deadness. But there were more facts to contemplate. That wasn't just all of the facts before him. There were the facts about God. And Abraham also carefully considered this greater fact that what God promised, he was able also to perform. Contemplating the first set of facts in verses 19 and 20 about himself and then considering the second set of facts in verse 21 did not prove to be any difficulty for Abraham's faith because Abraham was fully assured, being fully assured that what God had promised he was able also to perform. That means he was fully persuaded by that fact that what God promises, he does. The human-oriented facts in verses 19 and 20, they didn't weaken his faith. And the God-oriented facts about the promiser fully persuaded him. To put it another way, he wasn't persuaded by the human-oriented facts, and he was strengthened by the God who promised. He wasn't weakened. And again, where does that kind of faith come from? It's the faith that's associated with justification. Verse 22, therefore it was also credited to him as righteousness. That kind of faith. Where does this kind of faith come from that that refused to only assess the promise through a creaturely lens, but also wanted to know the God of the promise? Where did that faith come from? What kind of faith is this? That when looking at creaturely facts and the impossibilities engulfing it, isn't persuaded, but instead is fully persuaded by God. Who promises? Where does that faith come from? Where did Abraham get it? Because this is important. This is the faith that belongs to justification. Verse 22. Did Abraham naturally, inherently possess this faith within himself? Was he the source of this exemplary faith? Did he have built into him from the very beginning this ability to trust Yahweh? He simply needed to just locate it within his ungodliness and unrighteousness and clean it off and exercise it toward Yahweh instead. Let's just remind ourselves again of what Abraham was prior to Yahweh coming into his life in Ur of the Chaldeans, where he lived with his father, Terah. 
Remember, Romans 1 describes what, what I was before God came into my life and saved me, and it describes what you are or what you were before God came into your life and saved you, and it describes Abraham, and that would have been a difficult one for the Jews who were disbelieving to swallow. They would have heard Romans 1, and the last person on their mind would have been their hero, Abraham. But let me take you back for just a moment. Go to Joshua 24. Joshua 24, it's the last chapter of Joshua. Joshua has taken the tribes into the promised land. He's giving them his farewell address. Joshua 24, verses 1 to 3, because he says something really important about Abraham that you must know or must be reminded of. Joshua 24, verse 1. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. And he called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and their judges and their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all of the people, thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel. So here's God's testimony. Here's God's facts he lays out. From ancient times, your fathers lived beyond the river, the Euphrates, namely Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river. That Abraham was a believer. He believed some things. Uh, He was fully persuaded by some things at that time in his life. He believed that he would suppress the truth about Yahweh He was fully persuaded to do that beyond the river. And he believed that he would not honor God as God. He believed that he would invent evil against God. Remember Romans 1? He was fully persuaded to do that beyond the river. And he believed beyond the river that he would exchange the glory of God for the image of idols that mocked God. God. He believed that he would exchange the truth about God and instead grab onto a lie. He was fully persuaded to do all of that against God beyond the river. And that was the ability to believe that was built into Abraham as an ungodly, unrighteous man who was filled with all unrighteousness, Romans 129. You can go back to Romans. His built-in ability to believe was full of unrighteousness as an idol worshiper. And therefore, that built-in ability to believe or to trust, it never led him to cast himself in faith on Yahweh, but instead, to only, it only led him to trust in anything and everything that wasn't Yahweh. You see, Romans 1 applies to Abraham. If not, if he is some exceptional man with a different ability to believe, we need some scriptures to tell us so. Every dimension of Abraham's person, of his being, was full of unrighteousness, just like for me, just like for you without Christ. His reasoning skills were full of unrighteousness. His emotions were full of unrighteousness. His grief and his rejoicing were full of unrighteousness, including his built-in ability to believe. It, too, was full of unrighteousness. Isn't that proven? Isn't that proven by the very fact that he worshipped idols instead of Yahweh, that he wanted to trust in idols and not Yahweh? So again... Where does this faith of Romans 4 come from? Where does does the Bible lead us to conclude that though man is full of unrighteousness, his ability to trust is something that's not affected by indwelling sin? It doesn't. Does the Bible lead us to conclude that every dimension of man except for one is ruined by sin? It's his built-in ability to believe that isn't ruined. 
does the Bible teach that that built-in ability to believe somehow has remained unscarred by the fall and is pure and is righteous? It doesn't. Here's the simple but profound truth. Abraham had a built-in, unrighteous, and ungodly ability to express trust, to express faith, and he used it to trust in idols, not Yahweh. That unrighteous ability to believe, it led him to exchange the truth of Yahweh for a lie. It led him to exchange the glory of Yahweh for an image that mocked Yahweh. Oh, Abraham certainly could believe, and he did, apart from God. And it meant that he was an idolater. So then, Romans 4, verses 18 to 22, what Romans 4 describes is not that built-in faith. Romans 4, 18 to 22 is not a description of Abraham's inherent ability to trust. Romans 1 is a description of Abraham's built-in inherent ability to trust in idols. The faith that is on stunning display in Romans 4 is inseparable from justification. It is a description of the faith that God brings in his grace to unrighteous, ungodly idol worshipers who believe anything and everything else but God currently. It's a description of the faith that God in his grace brings to the unrighteous sinner, to the ungodly sinner who currently believes that he should hate Yahweh. And our great God and our great Savior, in his mercy and in his grace, with that gift of faith in his hand, he approaches that rebel sinner who believes that he should hate God and contemplate a way to get rid of God. And that God in his grace with the gift of faith says, stop that. Repent of your unrighteous trust. Repent of your ungodly faith. And believe me instead with this faith I bring to you by my grace. It is my gift to you. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one would boast. And with, listen to me, with that God-given faith, when it comes to you, you won't be afraid to look at the human impossibility before you of being saved. You won't be afraid that you have absolutely no resources and you are essentially as good as dead before God. That won't weaken that faith. With this gift of God's faith, you won't waver back and forth into your old rebellious disbelief against God. And with this gift of God's faith, you will find God strengthening you to exercise that gift of faith he brought to you so that you could be even more and more vigorous in your expression of it. And with that God-given faith, you will want God's glory to be seen for what it truly is. And by God's gift of faith to you, you will be fully persuaded that what God promises in salvation through Jesus Christ, he is able also to perform. The exemplary faith of Abraham that he is exercising, it is the gift of God's grace that believes Yahweh in all of the opposite ways that Abraham's built-in ability to trust once operated towards idols. Where did Abraham get this faith? God gave it to him. He certainly didn't look within himself and clean off his wretched inherent ability to believe and tune it up and run it towards Yahweh instead of idols. He received this faith according to grace. Chapter 4, verse 16. For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace. The promise of God is that way to Abraham and to his descendants, and justification is that way. Faith operates according to grace, the gift that God gives. Abraham exercised that gift of faith, and God credited it to him as righteousness. Verse 22. 
Have you ever thought about the faith you're exercising? You, right now, you are a believer. Even if you say you don't believe in God or believe in Jesus, you, you do. You're a believer, the Bible says. You're fully persuaded by some things. You're either fully persuaded by your own built-in, unrighteous, and ungodly version of believing and trusting or God's precious gift of grace. Do, do you know which one you're exercising? And you say, well, how can I know? Well, you just go back and you look at the life of Abraham's faith and you compare when you look at the bleakness of your own ability to please God, do you also eventually look away from yourself to the God who is able to perform what he promises in his word? Do you do that? That's a good sign that it's God's faith he gave to you. Do you find God strengthening you to exercise the faith he has given you to trust him with? Or, or are you unconcerned to exercise faith with greater vigor? Ah, I don't really care. I kind of believe like I always have. That's not a good sign. Do you want God to be seen to be the glorious God that he is as you exercise your faith in him? Or do you use faith as an opportunity to magnify yourself in the sight of others? Is justification by that gift of faith from God, is that precious to you? Is it humbling to you? Does that gift of faith bring you relief that you don't have to work to earn God's favor? These are the kinds of questions you can ask yourself from chapter 4, verses 18 to 22 to help you discern which faith you're exercising, which trusting you're doing, which believing you're doing. What an exemplary faith concerning justification. Your own built-in faith won't get you a righteous status before God that he'll accept. It just won't. But the gift of his faith for you to exercise will. And he'll even strengthen you for it. That's what we learn from Abraham's exemplary faith. Now, why? Why was that account of Abraham's faith written in the Old Testament? That leads us to the second point. Notice with me, number two, the extended design of justification. The extended design of justification. Verse 23, look at it with me. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be accredited as those who believe in him. The account of Abraham wasn't recorded simply and solely that we might just remember him when we read it. Progressive revelation has occurred, and it tells us through Romans 4 what the Old Testament was intending in the account of Abraham's faith. It was revealed, it was written for our sakes too. We who believe in God, verse 24. You see, Abraham was justified in the same manner of faith by which we are justified in Jesus. The imputation of righteousness, God putting into our account righteousness, that is secured by us who believe Jesus, and that is just like Abraham's imputation of righteousness through faith alone in Yahweh. What this means is God didn't have blinders on as he was writing through Moses the account of Abraham, and he couldn't see anything else. Abraham and justification in the Old Testament were not in a cul-de-sac location that just brings an end to the story. But rather, they are instead on a revelational highway, we find out, that has been extended all the way to us who believe the God who raised Jesus from the dead. And again, what this does is it accents the unity between the Older Testament and the Newer Testament between the Old Testament and the Gospel. And it accents how useful and helpful the Old Testament is for us who believe Christ. It was not for his sake only written. It was written for our sake. Then go there, believer. Read it. Look for other believers like Abraham. Grab all you can from what you see of that faith. Faith. 
In chapter 15 of Romans, in verse 4, Paul says this, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. It was written for our sake. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says this, now these things happened to them, Israel in the wilderness, as an example that they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And you know 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures inspired by God. The Old Testament is God-breathed and it is profitable for us. Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Let this become a motivation for you to explore the Old Testament with greater anticipation and even greater joy. Be eager to find this kind of God-given faith in the Old Testament that actually defies the fallen nature within. Ask God to give you eyes to see it, to find it, to locate that faith in the Old Testament for, for then a heart to rejoice in it. That's the same faith that I've been given to trust Jesus in justification. Notice lastly with me, number three, the exalted God of justification. You were concerned that number two was going to go as long as number one did, weren't you? It doesn't. Number three does, but number two doesn't. Just kidding. The exalted God of justification. Uh, how amazing and how helpful to examine the faith that God gives to examine the faith that is the means through which justification comes. That's what the first part of this passage is, is really all about. But Paul doesn't end on that faith note. Rather, he directs us to the God of our faith and the God of our justification. Let's pick it up halfway through verse 24. We are those who believe in him, him who raised Jesus our Lord, from the dead. Our faith through which God's righteous status comes to us, it, it's not an aimless faith, a faceless faith. It's not faith for the sake of faith. It is faith in God, this God. And that God was very busy. He was at work in our salvation. What was God up to? Verse 24, he raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He raised his son from the dead. There's a, there's a beautiful likeness between the events surrounding Abraham and his justification by faith alone and Jesus, God's son, and our justification by faith alone. Uh, remember, according to verse 19, Abraham's and Sarah's body, bodies, they, they were like a, a grave of deadness, right? But out of that deadness came a living son, Isaac. And Abraham believed God who, who gives life to the dead, verse 17. And that belief in that God who brought a living son out of his own deadness was credited to him as righteousness. And now the gospel comes along and tells us God's son, came out of the grave of death too, but it was his own. It was his own deadness, his own death. God brought a living son out of Abraham and Sarah's deadness, and the same God, for our sake, in the gospel, raised his own son from the realm of the dead. And like Abraham, we believed that same God who raised his son from the dead, and it was credited to us as righteousness. Your Old Testament and your New Testament are in complete agreement in regards to justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Verse 24 mentions both Jesus dead and being raised by God. Verse 25 tells the details of that death that preceded his resurrection. Look at verse 25. He is the one who was delivered over because of our transgressions, meaning he was delivered over all of the way to death for our transgressions. 
He wasn't delivered merely over to the religious leaders of the Jews in the temple because of our transgressions, like they had any concern for our transgressions. And it's not that he was delivered all the way over to Pilate, the Roman governor, because of our transgressions, because Pilate was concerned about our transgressions. No, he was delivered all the way over to death on the cross because God was concerned about our transgressions. And God, the Father, is the one who has delivered his son over. He, he was the one who was delivered over because of our transgressions. And Romans chapter 8, verse 32, only confirms this. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Do you remember how Jesus' death is central in our justification as believers? Look back at Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Do you see it there? being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. That redeeming work is the shedding of his blood to pay the ransom price to set us free from our sin that occurred at the cross. His resurrection from the dead is also in Romans 4.25. He was raised In Romans 3.25, his death and the shedding of his blood was to satisfy the wrath of God against us, whom God displayed, chapter 3, verse 25, publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. His death, the shedding of his blood was to satisfy the wrath of God against us, and that was all, according to chapter 4, verse 25, God giving his son over to death at the cross for our sake because of our transgressions our sins against God. But notice that it is not only Jesus' death that's connected to our justification. In chapter 3, his resurrection from the dead is also connected to our justification. The last part of verse 25 in chapter 4. And this is the one who was raised because of our justification. His death was the means through which, that redemption, through which justification came to us, chapter 3, verse 24, but that doesn't mean that Jesus could stay in the grave. That doesn't mean that justification was only concerned to see Jesus die. Because chapter 4, verse 25 tells us that God the Father raised Jesus because of our justification. Justification was equally concerned with Jesus' resurrection from the dead as it was for his ransom payment in his blood and his death at the cross. God wasn't content to see his obedient son remain in the grave. He raised him up. He raised him up after giving him over in death, and he did it for our justification. So how did this chapter begin? What then shall we say that? Abraham, our forefather found, our forefather according to the flesh has found. And how does the chapter end? This God who raised Jesus, our Lord from the dead, this Jesus who was delivered over because of our transgressions, this Jesus who was raised because of our transgressions. It began with Abraham, it ends focusing on Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. The gospel, with the Old Testament's backing, links Abraham to Jesus and Jesus to Abraham. And the Old Testament declares that justification was never for Abraham alone. It was God's intent for us, even who believe in Christ. What's impressive in our justification is not me and not you who believe. What's impressive is the faith that God gives us to exercise, but what is most impressive in our justification is our God, the one who performs our justification. The one who works in justification is him, it is not us. Remember, we said things like this as we close. This is the God who won't free you from your sin, chapter 3, verse 24, but then leave himself angry with you because of your sin, verse 25. He won't redeem you, but not propitiate his wrath. 
You can flip it the other way around too, right? It works back the other way. God won't satisfy his anger against you, but leave you still a slave to your sin. And we could add this. He's the God who won't ransom you and satisfy his wrath against you, but leave you unrobed without his righteous status in justification. Figuring out how you're going to get it. You have to have that too. And finally, best of all, we could say this. He is our God who won't do all of that for us, but leave his son in the grave. He must and he did raise him up for our justification. Let's pray. Father above, we marvel at your your great work in salvation, in justification. That you would deliver your son over so that he could, in the shedding of his blood, ransom us out of slavery to sin and that he, through the shedding of his blood, could satisfy your wrath against us and that you in your grace and in your kindness would give to us a faith that we can't produce ourselves in you. That you would even strengthen us in the exercising of that faith so that you would then declare us righteous with your status of righteousness. No man makes up this kind of God. Rather, you revealed yourself to us through this amazing book, this revelation of you. And we thank you. We give glory to you. You are worthy of it. Thank you for saving sinners like us. In Jesus' name, amen.